Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Cheney, the CEO of the American Security Project. And I want to welcome you to what is a continuing series that we're having on the defense budget and budget issues. And today we're going to talk about acquisition and acquisition reform. Uh, for those not familiar with the American Security Project, founded in 2005 by Senators Kerry Hart, uh, Rudman, and Hagel, I'm sure names you're familiar with, and a number of issues that they were particularly inter interested in were climate change, nuclear security, energy security, acquisition reform, uh, American competitiveness, among others. So they formed a board that was comprised of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, businessmen and women, and then they added seven or eight flag officers, three and four star from all the services, to put a national security bet on each one of these issues. Uh, we have folks that are interested in all these, and one in particular is interested in defense budget, and has asked us to host a series of forums on that, so that's how come we're doing this event today. Among our esteemed board members is Norm Augustine, and uh, those, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Norm, Norm Welcome today, thank you for coming, he uh, made a run right off the Capitol, Hill, just got out from the House uh, Armed Services Committee here about 45 minutes ago. Uh, Norm is a Princeton grad, uh, when you look at Norm's jobs that he's had, both in industry and in the government, you can't help but be impressed. I think there's a very strong Army connection here. As I, as I look down, you were Assistant Secretary of the Army, Under Secretary of the Army, and Acting Secretary of the Army. He's been second in order there, and then, of course, he went to Martin Marietta, uh, became CEO and Chairman of Martin Marietta, followed that on with Chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin. And for those who might not know, he was the uh, chairman of the Red Cross for almost a decade here at following Lockheed Martin. And he's been on our board for uh, a considerable period of time and uh, helps lend a very strong business and DOD perspective to our board. And, and Norm, of course, we're very grateful. Uh, the topic today is defense budget issues. The way I'd like to run this is I'm going to turn it over to Norm in a couple minutes and let him make some brief comments. And we'll perhaps have a little conversation between the two of us. Then I'll open up the Q&A. Same rules apply. I'll have got a rope microphone. If you just stick your hand in the air, I'll, I'll pick on you. If you can stand and tell us who you are and uh, ask a short question, hopefully we can get some spirited uh, dialogue going here. Uh, when you look at what's going on this last year in the budget uh, cycle, I, I think we've all been amazed at it, frankly. We went through sequestration, and you got the budget ceiling, and then, and then miracle upon miracles, we got a defense budget. It, to me, it, it did seem somewhat of a miracle. Uh, and then you look at the defense budget and perhaps reductions in that. Uh, still a very substantial budget, although it is being cut back somewhat, as, as we're all familiar. Uh, I'm going to be very interested in hearing Norm's take on what you think the budget means to the Defense Department and where it, it's going to affect industry. Uh, we're all familiar with the excesses or problems on the acquisition side of the House. There are multiple projects that have had overruns, and, but there are some that are very successful, and I think Norm can talk about both of those. Uh, some of them are incredibly inefficient, but some are efficient as well. So with that, Norm, let me turn, lay the groundwork, turn it over to you, and uh, let you make some comments, and then we'll get going. Well, thank you, and uh, I, I see so many friends in the audience here. I feel like I'm back home. Thank you for coming. Uh, the general has been very kind in introducing me. And, uh, whenever I hear an introduction like that, there's a story I always like to tell. It's just, uh, about a friend of mine, David Robert, who was at the time uh, CEO of U.S. Steel some years ago. And uh, David was being introduced uh, before an audience. And the person who introduced him said he was one of America's most gifted business persons and proven. He just cited one simple fact. He said David had made $10 million in California oil. And uh, David came to the podium. It was clear that he was embarrassed. He said the introduction was essentially accurate, but he said that uh, truthfully it had not been California. It was, it was Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, it wasn't uh, oil. It was coal. And uh, actually, it wasn't uh, 10,000. It was $10 million, It was 10,000. And uh, it wasn't he. It was his brother. And, uh, but he hadn't made it, he lost it. So, <laughs> thank you, Steve, for the great introduction. Uh, what I said was true. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> I, I have had the opportunity to work with the folks here at ASP for uh, a number of years. And 
the thing that attracted me to it was the uh, bipartisanship. Uh, this was back before the current breakdown in our government. But uh, it, it struck me that uh, if we're going to have a strong national defense and many other things that this nation needs, somehow we need to uh, promote the bipartisanship that this place engenders. And uh, <coughs> I found it to be a place where you can disagree without being disagreeable. In this town, that's pretty refreshing at this point. Uh, this is the subject I've got is the defense budget and acquisition reform. Hardly a spellbinding topic. Uh, uh, there have been, with regard to the latter uh, acquisition reform, there have been, I'm sure, a hundred studies of that. Uh, I think I've worked on more than that myself. Uh, the, uh, so what I kind of like to do is a smorgasbord of topics is to open up with, and then we can pick, out on, pick up on whatever is of interest to in the group. Uh, the uh, first study of the acquisition process that I got involved in way back in 1967, and it was the Fitzhugh study. It was a blue ribbon panel uh, that looked at the best department management of acquisition. And uh, there's one summary sentence in it that I'll never forget, because it, it sort of said the, the issue is that uh, everyone is responsible for everything and no one is responsible for anything. And over the years, uh, the, the acquisition process has gotten better. Uh, you could look at the numbers. Uh, clearly, it's gotten better, but it still is not as could be as, as good as could be. And I think what, one of the things that is important, the way of background with regard to the acquisition process, is that uh, acquisition has a lot more in common with business than it does with government. Uh, it, it's basically a business function that we, it involves business processes and people who are some knowledge of business. Uh, at the same time, uh, business people are, are fond of saying if we only ran the government like a business, everything would be okay. If you think back, uh, the founding fathers, or founding parents, or whatever, uh, the founding fathers uh, went out of their way to make sure that we didn't run the government like a business. I mean, it wasn't an accident. Uh, in, a, in a business, somebody could make a decision their consequences for not uh, carrying out the, those decisions, uh, which is much less the case of government. Uh, our founders came mostly from Europe, uh, where they had experienced kings and czars, and they didn't want much power put in one person's hands, whereas in companies, a lot of power is put in individual hands. Uh, yes, it masks as a democracy. I had to run for office and CEO 10 different times, but nobody ever ran against me. And, uh, so that's not much of a democracy, even though we like to think it is in business. Uh, and so uh, it seemed like the uh, the founders said, uh, we'll have three different branches of government, we'll have all these checks and balances. And uh, they must have known that was terribly inefficient in the business sense. But they were willing to pay that price. Uh, in order to assure that not too much power got concentrated in any one individual, such as one sees today in Russia, where essentially we have a czar again. Uh, the, uh, the consequence is that government business functions are not run very efficiently to be candid, and they never will be. On the other hand, they could do a lot better than they have been doing, and uh, that would be kind of the thrust of what I'd like to talk a little bit about. As I say this, I think back a few years ago uh, when uh, President Bush 41 was in the uh, White House. I was talking about this very subject and I made the comment that uh, uh, the, uh, the, it was a, a thing on the role of the presidency and my role was to speak on uh, uh, the business aspects of being president of the United States from the perspective of the, the fossils. And uh, I made the comment that uh, the, the presidency uh, established in the Constitution is a sorry way to run a business. And the next day, USA Today had a picture of President Bush, a little picture of me superimposed on it, saying that I had said the president was running a sorry business. And uh, you can imagine, I, I worked for Lockheed Martin at the time, or Martin or Ed, I guess it was. You can imagine how our public relations people felt about that. And 
And so, uh, unfortunately, there was a tape recording that one of the television networks had made that showed exactly what I said. So we went and asked the USA Today to do a correction. So about a week later on page C43, there was a correction that said we had quoted Augustine as saying that the presidency was a sorry way to run a business. Actually, what he said was all three branches were a sorry way to run a business. And so uh, I, I happened to run into a John Sununu long after that, and I said, I doubt that it had ever come up, but if the president ever did mention this, let me tell you what actually happened, and so hopefully you can explain it. About a, a week later, I got a handwritten note from the president saying, uh, uh, if you think I don't understand about being misquoted, you're more naive than I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> it's a letter I treasure. Uh, today, uh, we are going to have major cuts in defense spending. I mean, that, there's no way about it. Uh, some of the events uh, recent weeks you think might turn that around, but my, my guess is that uh, it won't have an enormous impact. Uh, I was testifying this morning about the nuclear deterrent. People are concerned, but uh, I'd be very surprised if there's anything radical happens uh, with regard to the budget. Uh, I emphasize that comment with regard to the budget. Uh, and so defense companies are facing major opportunity losses. Uh, and as always happens under that circumstance, they begin to, to, to downsize and to diversify. And uh, one of the things that I think is important to remember that defense companies are no different uh, from other companies uh, when it comes to their ability to raise capital. They go to the same capital markets as Microsoft or Facebook or anybody else. And uh, sometimes people work in the defense department uh, get the idea that defense companies somehow have a, an asterisk in the Wall Street Journal listing that says they're in the defense business, so they're allowed certain uh, freedoms in terms of performance. <coughs> well, defense companies to survive have to profit, and uh, that's also true in a downturn, which uh, uh, of course is challenging. I've one important thing to keep in mind, I think, is that although you may be able to build an economy based on a service, large service sector, uh, I don't think you can win wars with a service economy. Uh, you have to have a manufacturing economy somewhere, or at least a large segment. And if you go back to the 1950s, 27% uh, uh, of our economy was uh, manufacturing. Today it's a little bit less than 10%. And uh, I would say that to uh, see that continue to shrivel uh, is not a healthy thing for the nation. Uh, I tend to view the, our industry as uh, the fifth military service. Uh, I don't think you can win wars without a strong military service any more than you can win strong wars without a strong army or a uh, Marine Corps or what have you. Uh, and uh, I think, though, that our industry is in danger, uh, just as our military uh, is itself, particularly as its equipment uh, ages and as the force downsizes. Uh, once again, some years ago, when I was in industry, actually, uh, I got thinking about how long our military was going to have to keep the average item of equipment at home. And in business, that's pretty easy to calculate. Uh, you uh, take the uh, asset value tangible assets, excluding land and buildings, and you divide it by your reinvestment in those categories. So I went to a friend who was controller at the time, and I went in and I, I said, uh, could you tell me what the net asset value is of the defense department's holdings? And he laughed. Uh, they had no idea. Uh, they, nobody ever bothered to calculate it. So I tried to calculate it as best as I could, and I divided it by the current reinvestment rate. And at that time, which was a better time than we're headed to, I think, uh, the conclusion was that the average item of the, the military, <coughs> military owns, uh, exclusive of land and buildings, uh, had to last for 43 years. That includes airplanes, submarines, mess kits, uh, what, what have you. And uh, that's kind of a daunting thought in an age where technology, there are all kinds of ways to measure the half-life of technology, but depending on the field, it's anywhere from two years to 10 or 15 years. So uh, 
uh, how do you maintain a moderate force uh, in that kind of a, an environment? Uh, that leads me to the subject that uh, one of the things the acquisition process suffers from in the nation is we have no defense capital budget. Uh, we have no capital budget for the nation. I know of no company in this country, successful or otherwise, frankly, uh, that doesn't maintain a capital budget. Uh, but we don't do that in this country. And the consequence is we tend to take a very short view, term view of things and uh, pay for that in the long run. <coughs> Uh, the last time we saw a major cut uh, spending like this uh, was in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the company I then worked for uh, uh, was Martin Marietta, and happily, uh, from the company standpoint, uh, we somewhat foresaw the budget cuts coming, and uh, we spent a lot of time planning for what one might do uh, when they actually occurred. And I should say that we had the wrong reasons in many cases for why the budget cuts would likely come, but uh, come they did. Uh, and so we used to talk about putting together a powder magazine so that when the budget were cut, there'd be opportunity. And indeed, there are opportunities in difficult times for companies, uh, as well as for the Defense Department. Uh, you can uh, sell changes uh, in tough times. You can't sell in good times. The, uh, in, a, in the case of the defense industry as a whole, uh, prior to that downturn in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, to buy a dollar's worth of sales in the defense uh, sector, aerospace sector, cost you about a, a, a dollar to buy a company with a dollar's worth of sales. Uh, at the bottom, you could buy companies uh, for 25 cents on the dollar. So if you timed it right, you'd save your money. You, you could uh, combine a lot of companies uh, at a very uh, low price. And the strategy at that time was to uh, uh, build a critical mass, take uh, a number of companies with half full factories or third full or a tenth full, combine them, shut down the factories that you can't use, and the ones you can't run at full speed so you could be very efficient and very competitive. That simple form was the idea of creating Lockheed Martin, which uh, I'm only slightly biased, but I think it's a, a very fine company uh, today, uh, thanks mostly to the folks who've been leading in recent years and today. <coughs> but uh, uh, people will argue it was a good thing to downsize. Uh, today, I don't think you could downsize the primes very much more, maybe a little bit, but not a lot. It was a good thing to go from 15 to 4. Could argue that today I think there will be a great deal of emphasis on the sub tiers, consolidating, downsizing, getting out of the business, uh, diversifying. And uh, uh, one asks how few is too few uh, companies. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, when you get down to too small a number, you basically are de facto nationalize the industry, which I don't think is good for the nation or for the industry. Uh, at the last supper, uh, we were told that uh, in many areas the country could only afford one company. Uh, that was not in the aerospace business, but it was in such places as building submarines and uh, unique, expensive items like that. Uh, whatever the case, uh, it becomes more and more imperative to use every dollar as effectively as you can, and that brings us back to the acquisition process. And, uh, <coughs> If it is a business, it's important to have leadership uh, in the government uh, that does understand business and also understands the principle of the foundation of the country. But uh, uh, to, it, it, throughout the modern history of the nation, which I would start with sometime just before World War II, uh, typically that about 50% of the presidential appointees in our government uh, had a business background. Today it's about 8%. And part of that's the conflict of interest rules, well-meaning, uh, but damaging in my opinion. And uh, 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 there are many other reasons we can talk about. Uh, with regard to the acquisition process, just to wrap up, uh, what could we do? I think there's a long list of things we could do. Uh, one obviously is to uh, have capital budgets. Uh, no chance of that. 
Uh, another thing we could do is have more stability in the form of multi-year funding. We're the only country I know of, large country, uh, that I know of that doesn't uh, have multi-year defense uh, programs uh, across the board. Uh, uh, our requirements process, uh, although it proved uh, uh, needs major help, uh, it's too uh, stereotyped, if you will, where the requirements people, the operators, uh, slip under the door, this is what we need. The builders, the engineers look at it and say, oh, that'll be neat, let's do that. Uh, that's a real challenge. Uh, I have an engineer. Uh, and the cost people usually aren't even on the table. And no one adds it all up, it takes a forecast of what is a reasonable projection of the defense budget in the future. It's kind of nice if the Congress gave you one. Uh, and it says, we tend to approve programs one by one. We don't stack them all up to see what the uh, eventual outcome uh, uh, might be in terms of our uh, affordability. And that brings me to the bottom line, is that whatever we do, we need to match uh, our goals to our resources. Uh, the worst thing we can do is to have goals that we announce that we don't have resources uh, to support. Uh, that's the most dangerous thing and the most inefficient thing we can do. And if we decide we can't afford more for national security, uh, we should face that, and downsize our goals, and say public, we're, we're prepared to take more risk. We're going to do that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're good at keeping the same goals, uh, downsizing the resources, and not admitting that we're taking more risk. Uh, I think that is a problem. I see this as a very difficult time in the sense that we're having to prepare for a new kind of war. Uh, Doing quotes, uh, the, the Afghanistans, the, the uh, Iraqs, and so on. Uh, the problem is, the last time I checked, the old kind of war wasn't out loud anywhere. And so uh, the possibility of old kinds of wars in places like uh, uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, North Korea, Iran, they could well happen. So the task has gotten harder. We've got two totally different kinds of wars to prepare for. Meanwhile, we shouldn't forget about the nuclear deterrent. That's what I was testifying about this morning. I think we are forgetting about the nuclear deterrent in the long term. I would emphasize that today I have no question that the nuclear deterrent is there and strong. But uh, over the long term, uh, I'm not worried about the direction we're, we're headed. Uh, so, uh, I would close with one other concern that we ought to talk about. If we're talking about a strong uh, defense industry, a strong defense department, uh, we need uh, a source of capable engineers. And if you look at our, uh, our system today, uh, you're probably familiar with the international tests, the test 15-year-olds, uh, the U.S. Three years ago, we were 17th in, uh, in uh, science and 25th in math out of the 34 OECD nations. Uh, we lost four places since then in, uh, in, in uh, science and one in math. So we're 21st and 26th out of 34. Uh, I went through some of that data pretty carefully. It turns out that the children of people doing janitorial type work Shanghai, uh, their children scored much higher than U.S. children of professionals score in this country in, in math uh, at 15, 15 years old. Uh, in Shanghai, 55% of the uh, uh, top two PISA categories, 55% uh, of the students in Shanghai, 50, 15 years old, score in the top two categories. In the U.S., it's 9%. In terms of the percentage of college degrees that are awarded in engineering, uh, we finish in 79th place out of the 93 nations study, uh, in a recent study. Uh, with the country, we're most closely represented in both engineering and science as Mozambique. Uh, the countries behind us are countries like uh, Botswana, Cuba, uh, and so on. Uh, and so I, I think that my last opening comment would be that uh, I've dealt with an awful lot of departments in our government, 
and as much criticism as the DOD gets, and particularly its acquisition process, uh, it's still the best of the bunch, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but that doesn't mean it can't be better, and it doesn't mean it's not going to have to be better. So, with those comments, you know, I'll turn it back to you. Right, Norm, great comments. <clears throat> You know, I always told my kids that if they just cleaned the bathroom, it'd be a better educational experience. For them. <laughs> and they just never listened to me. But the, uh, uh, I want to just ask you a little bit about regulatory reform and regulation. And when you talk to folks involved in the acquisition process, a lot of them point to the government and say, everywhere we turn, there's another regulation, there's another layer of management, there's another layer of scrutiny. If they would just streamline that whole business and make it more efficient and less regulatory, we could do our job that much better. Do you find that experience somewhat similar to what happened to you when you were in the industry? I, I think that uh, somehow we've confused, particularly in our government, uh, regulation for management. And uh, we get unhappy with something that happens in management, so we pass a regulation and we'll never let that happen again. And we get all these bad things piled on top of uh, each other. The, uh, I've been encountering, uh, let me take the example of uh, the government's ethics program. Uh, I've been, since I most recently encountered it, I've encountered the state of Maryland's ethics program. Uh, those of you who know me, I hope, think that I'm very committed to ethical comportment because to me that's the most important thing that a leader can, can say and breaks. But, uh, uh, we've got the idea that uh, the more pages of forms you have to fill out, the more ethical you are. And so you can measure a person's ethics by Mary has 73 pages, she filled out, John filled out 22 pages. And we've substituted regulation, uh, not just the ethics area, but others. And, uh, the battle I'm in currently, I'm, I'm a region of the University System of Maryland, and you have to fill out this huge form. And uh, one of the questions, uh, they want to know the value of my house. Well, it's not clear to me why to be a region of the University System of Maryland, the government needs to know the value of my house. And so I refuse to fill it out. Now they can go to Google and find out. They can ask the Maryland County and find out. In fact, I'll tell them if they really need to know. But it just offends me that, uh, that we've gotten to the point that that's the kind of forms you fill out. When I was at Martin Marietta we, in California, uh, we had a chemical treatment facility. Uh, and the state of California put in a big regulation. You had to fill out all these forms for every part that went through. So our people computerized it, widely enough, the form. The computer cranked it out. Well, the software left one thing out. I can't remember what it was. It was something fairly innocuous, what time of day it was or something. And so that was missing in every form we submitted. One day you pick up the newspaper and it turned out that uh, we didn't have a violation. The headline said we had 15,000 violations, one for every part we had put through since we put the software system in. Uh, that's the kind of thing that just leads to terrible inefficiency and demotivating to people. And uh, uh, the U.S. clearly leads in, uh, in regulation today. Uh, you need some regulation. I don't argue against that, but I, I do think it's a, a big factor in the inefficiency. Another question I had was on requirements and what gets submitted or what starts out as something you want that morphs into something entirely different and each time you make a change to whatever the requirement was, the cost increases and hence one, five, ten years down the pike the program that was initially budgeted for X turns out to be budgeted four times X. Uh, did you find a lot of frustration dealing with the Defense Department in that exact realm where they constantly made changes to what they were asking for? You know, as, as I said, I, I spent 10 years in the Defense Department, so I have a great deal of respect for the problems that they face. But uh, I, my first day at work after I got out of college, they gathered all the, the newbies into a room. And I remember the chief engineer, well, by the name of Al Kara. I worked for Douglas Aircraft at the time. He, I remember him standing there and he said, no change is a small change. And boy, is that true. I've relearned that to the expense of my, my uh, employers so many times over the years. And every time you make a change, it tumbles down. And uh, I think of uh, the great successes, for example, uh, Kelly Johnson. Uh, 
Kelly controlled changes himself. And uh, he didn't make a change to his airplane without him approving it. You had to have a pretty compelling reason. And uh, it, it's a matter of discipline. Most of this stuff is management 101. I mean, it, uh, unfortunately, that, coming back to your, your regula regulations question, uh, you know, we try to substitute regulations for management. And it doesn't work. Uh, management's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's not rocket science. I have a you know, it's, it's interesting, in the years that I was in defense, I, one of the years I was up in the head office, uh, Don Atwood was the, yeah. was the deputy, great experience in the auto industry and uh, with GM, uh, and clearly the reason he was picked for that was because of his industry acquisition experience. And you conform to that idea that really the guy who ought to be the number two or in, in that field ought to come out of industry and understand it. I sure do. Uh, there have been some great people at the, at the leadership of the DOD. Uh, in my opinion, the best team uh, was, uh, I'm showing my age here, but it was Mel Laird and Dave Packer. Uh, because Mel was awfully good at dealing with the Congress and the public, the outside world, and understanding world issues. Uh, Dave didn't want to be bothered with that. He ran things. And Mel didn't want to be bothered running things. So there was a clear understanding who did what. There wasn't a lot of overlap. It was easy. I worked for them. It was easy to work for them because you knew who to go to for what issue. And uh, I, it would be, there are a couple of things you need to know, I think, to be Secretary of Defense. One, uh, you need to understand the political system. You need to understand the world system. And you have to be a manager. I mean, you run a huge organization. And uh, it's very hard to find an individual who does all three of those things. That, to me, says you need a team. And it has to work as a team. And, uh, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the number one be the acquisition kind of guy. And the number two, I think, all the better if the number one has some background in that subject. But uh, uh, it, you've got to build a team. With that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A for anybody who's got a great question for and all August day, and if you just raise your hand, and I'll, this young lady right here will bring you a microphone and just tell me who you are initially and try to uh, keep the question relatively short. Uh, I'm Miriam Pemberton from the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, back in the mid 90s, uh, you wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs um, that had a memorable <coughs> quote in it. Uh, it was, Conversion has a record unblemished by success, and that was. Uh, repeated over and over, and in the context of the whole article, I think it was uh, somewhat misinterpreted. Um, but I'm wondering what you meant by that, and if diversification is one of the strategies that you're seeing uh, for defense companies going forward. I um, wonder if you have maybe three or so pieces of advice about how to go about it and how not to, what, what to do and what not to do. That's a great question. That, that was one of the many things I've said in my life that have come back to haunt me. And uh, it was during a press interview at the time that the, the Soviet Union collapsed, the defense budget was collapsing. And I, I was asked about what the industry usually does in this circumstance. I said they diversify, or we diversify, and that our record is unblemished by success. And uh, unfortunately it was. And I think the thing that to get to the meat of your question, uh, the, the mistake, uh, when you try to diversify, they're kind of uh, two, two legs, if you will, one of which is uh, if you try to diversify into a totally new kind of product, uh, that's one leg. The other is to diversify to a new kind of customer. And we often in the industry try to do both at once. I always think of evil can evil. Who, uh, you know, they have said he always was leaping deep canyons at two bounds. And uh, that, that's kind of what this was. It didn't work very well. And I do think that not as a leap, but gradually you can move in one direction or the other. But if you try to change the customer structure, namely the government for private uh, consumers, and you also try to change the product, uh, I know of almost no cases where that's worked. Uh, but there are some cases that have worked and are working uh, where you change one thing at a time. So I think that that's a, a, a big a big difference. 
and also to do it more gradually. You can't do this uh, one steps. It's, it's a continuous process. We go to this side. Yes, sir. Hold on. We'll get your microphone. Peter McPherson, Association of Large Public Universities. Norm, thank you for your comments about engineers. As you know, we totally agree with you. Uh, a couple of questions. One, I think we found, as the Japanese and others uh, effectively competed with our manufacturers here, that they did so in part <coughs> by cutting down their own bureaucracy, the system to the system. Rest of this, uh, and a number of other measures, of course. And I, DOD, at least from I understand it, has never really captured that concept in an era of cutting budgets. I'm wondering if I think part of the regulation that we speak of is because you've got too many people, too many people that are tracking things. So I'm wondering what you what you think about that. And secondly, I, your comments about DOD doesn't have a capital budget. I, I'm convinced we're never going to get uh, a cool accounting in this government. I remember the Deputy Secretary of Treasury testified one time, I was certainly blowing his wind on that one, that the federal government ought to have a cool accounting instead of cash accounting. But I, I've thought that places like DOD and others, just for their own management, to uh, ought to have a second second book that's not quite the way to say it but you really need to have the management tools to know where your money and assets are in a way Congress does Congress doesn't want to use it at least for internal management and I've never really understood why uh, major places not just DOD but other major entities in this town couldn't do the same there's no reason why you in a back envelope would have to think about capital budget. Peter, great questions as always from you. Uh, start with the second one. Uh, uh, as you were talking, the thought went into my mind before you said it was two sets of books, and I think that's one of the, the challenges. But there really is no reason uh, the, the DOD couldn't keep its, uh, its own uh, management set of books, if you will, that's a poor way, as you said, to frame it, but uh, I, I give a lot of credit to Secretary McNamara. I, I had worked for him, and I didn't agree with him, but not an awful lot, but I, I think he brought a sense of order to the government, the Defense Department, that really wasn't there before he got there. We didn't know how many airplanes we had, let alone how many were in service, and the uh, likes, and uh, he really did put in a structure where you at least had the tools and you had a chance of managing and uh, I, I see no reason that uh, we couldn't do that. I think it's a good idea. Uh, with regard to the, the number of people, uh, during the downturn that I lived through, uh, the aerospace industry lost 40% uh, of its people and two-thirds of its companies uh, in about five or six years. So yes, you could do it. But the government, it is so much harder. I mean, it, uh, managing government like managing a university, that it's just really hard. Uh, because we have put in many laws to protect individual employees uh, for political uh, uh, pressures, uh, which is a good thing. But unfortunately, those same laws protect them from uh, consequences if they're not performing their <coughs> work properly. I've, some of those dedicated, talented people I've committed, I ever worked with when, when I was in government. In fact, I never worked harder than I when I was in the government. I used to say that to our board and always annoyed them, but it's true. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's very hard to uh, downsize the government, as we did the aerospace industry uh, uh, when we had to. Uh, because the aerospace industry, if the other guy downsizes it, you don't, then the whole, your whole ship sinks. Uh, in government, there's only one government. If you don't like the way the IRS do, does business, who are you going to go to? Well, you've got one IRS. And, uh, it, it's just uh, much harder. 
the most successful case of not downsizing but uh, resizing that I've seen uh, was when uh, uh, Bill Calloway was Secretary of the Army, bless his soul, he, we, we buried him last week, uh, and Jim Schlesser was Secretary of Defense. Bo made an agreement with the Secretary of Defense and with uh, the Congress, and that's another story. Uh, he could go at that, that time to four people on the Hill, uh, the chairman of the uh, uh, four committees, sort of oversee the Defense Department. And if those four chairmen said you could do something, then you could do it, you could take it to the bank. Uh, you can't do that today, of course, but in those days you could. Bo had an agreement with the uh, Secretary of Defense, the four chairmen, for every individual, civilian or military, that we would take out of the overhead structure, we could add one person in uniform and a combat unit. We could create new combat units for these people. We would equip those units, and they would open new bases to put them on. We added three and a third divisions to the Army by doing that. And uh, everybody got behind it. I mean, it became a, a, a real cause. When they found, he found a way to motivate the system. I remember there was one four-star general in the Pacific that recommended shutting his command down and combining it with another one so that we could save people and put them into combat units. So it, it can be done, but it's just awfully hard to get done. I'm uh, reminded of a meeting I had a couple weeks ago with a former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Was, I won't say bragging's not the right word, but he, but he mentioned that he had reduced the number of, number of assistant secretaries from 23 to 18 within the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, 23 to 18, which I found a staggering number, but he as it may, was headed in the right direction. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Hi, Hugh Grindstaff, and Norm, I remember you from the days of Public Employees Roundtable <coughs> and the President's Council on Management Improvement. And, but nowadays, my, my question right now is about the things like the main battle tank. If you look in the future of the U.S. military, ba uh, battles with tanks aren't going to be that necessary, but to try to cut the MVT's production means loss of jobs. How do you combine the loss of jobs, possibly, with the need for armaments? And the things like the F-35 overruns uh, just materialize and can be held back. Well, I'll stay away from the F-35 uh, because of a conflict of interest here. But uh, the, on the tanks, uh, the tank issue, I think, uh, I, well, we need a much more flexible force uh, than we have today. Uh, I still think we need tanks. I mean, the, the Soviets have them, the Chinese have them, uh, the Iranians have them. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't give up on those any more than I'd give up on manned aircraft. But uh, uh, clearly we might want to structure the force uh, way more one way than the other. Uh, and in my experience, the problem of changing the character of the force, uh, I was very much committed to the idea of remote piloted vehicles, as we called them way back when. And uh, one of the big challenges in making a change like that uh, is more with the Congress, frankly, than it is with the system itself. And uh, I certainly ran into that in NASA. I remember unwisely saying in one of the hearings, uh, does the nation want to have a space program or a jobs program? Because they're both worthy causes, but two different things. And, uh, I also remember when we went from a four-man tank to a three-man tank. There were a lot of people that didn't like that idea very well, or what we considered doing it. Uh, you remember we went from three people in a commercial airplane in the cockpit to two. Uh, that went down hard. But eventually technology does drive these things to the point where uh, you have to face up to some of them. I'm not yet ready to bury the tank, but uh, I am ready to say that a restructuring is probably appropriate. <coughs> My name is Ann Reese. I work for the House Appropriation Defense Subcommittee. Um, I spent 21 years in the Pentagon first, and I did work for Don Atwood. Um, I'm sure what you're saying um, about acquisition reform is very pertinent. I personally believe that uh, budget reform is very needed 
since 2003, we've not had a sequential planning, programming, and budgeting system. And during that time, your programmings have gone from $2 billion a year to $15 billion a year. But my question relates to your, on your, on your first page of comments, you talked about bipartisanship. Um, and that's something of great concern to me. I'm about to retire after 29 years of government service. And I've seen such a lack of bipartisanship. I find it very disheartening. Um, could you make some comments along those lines as to what you think is in the realm of the doable to recreate bipartisanship, or perhaps even get past the sequester? Well, first of all, thank you for all your service for all those years. And, uh, I wish I could come up with a silver bullet for this one because it's a cultural issue. I commented earlier today, uh, you don't legislate culture. Uh, the, uh, I, I first went to work at the Pentagon in 1965. And uh, uh, on the Hill, people disagreed. Uh, they voted, uh, but they were made friends. You could go sit down and discuss with them. I served in administrations for both parties. I uh, never had a problem. Uh, uh, but uh, that has certainly been lost. And uh, how you uh, do the bitterness that exists today, uh, I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, I don't have any answers uh, other than that uh, eventually things get so bad that everyone realizes this isn't working. And then we saw a little bit of that with the sequestration, I think, where I don't believe it's was realized just the damage that that did, uh, even down at the grassroots levels. And you point out the need for uh, better financial controls, uh, different kinds of budgeting systems, uh, the problem with the huge growth of reprogramming. Last time I checked, there were uh, 20, 20, excuse me, 10,000 earmarks, if you can believe that. Uh, the, uh, I've been working with some late, lately with the Department of Energy's nuclear uh, NSA, a National Nuclear Security Agency. And uh, in 1989, they had nine uh, control points or line items in their budget. Today, they're, uh, depending on which part of the organization, they were from 200 to 500. It's just a big change. And I'm going to take a bit. What you talk about is so important. I'm going to tell a story. Forgive me. I'm not going to name names here, but uh, I have a friend who rose at reasonably high levels in the government. Who, when he first got out of law school, became a staffer on the Hill. And uh, his senator was one of the leading senators at the time, which is a Southern gentleman. And uh, he was in a confrontation over a bill with a member of the other party. And uh, my friend uh, happened to notice that uh, there was a flaw in the other bill that was a catastrophic flaw. He went to the senator and said, boy, look what I found with God. And the senator, he tells the story. He said he put his arm over my shoulder and said, young man, that is mighty fine work that you've discovered that. And he said, let me show you how we solve this kind of problem here. And he sat down and he called up the other senator from the other party. I've got a young man here who's done some wonderful work and he's found a problem in your bill. This guy was the chairman that I talked about. He said, I'd like to come over to your office and discuss it with you. Uh, may I come over? And the other said, I'll come to your office. Right? I know, we'll come over to your office. So my friend and the chairman walked over to the other office and went in and introduced my friend. And the senator said, I, this young man has found a problem in your bill. Let me show you what it is. And I pointed out to He looked at it and said, oh my goodness, we didn't realize that. It basically destroys the purpose of the bill. So the next day, the other senator goes on the floor and said, I want to thank my friend so-and-so for pointing out this problem in my bill. And so uh, if it hadn't been for him, we would have created a problem. I apologize for that. And I'd like to withdraw the bill. And that was the way it was handled then. And, uh, uh, could you imagine that happening today? 
all the way in the back on the on the left side here. Hi, um, I'm Lee Munsell with Politico. I was wondering uh, on acquisition reform. There are a couple people in Congress trying to work on this. Mac Thornberry, Adam Smith um, are trying to do an acquisition reform effort. But as you know, this comes up every couple of years where they try to do an acquisition reform effort and um, actually make changes. So I'm wondering what you think of a current effort in Congress to make acquisition reform happen and what specifically you would like to see as far as reforms go um, that actually could make a dent. Um, as you said, you can't completely fix the problem, but you can make some changes you can do better. So I, I wanted to know specifically what that looks like. Yeah, you sure can. And I, my thoughts are really reflected in two documents that uh, I'd be happy to get for you. Uh, I, one you may have, and that was some testimony I gave on the subject of acquisition reform six weeks ago, probably. Uh, kind of going through uh, some of the, uh, the changes that one might introduce. And the other is there was a report some years ago by Ben's Business Executive for National Security on acquisition reform that uh, I was involved in and that kind of lists things I would recommend doing. And so rather than try to drag you through all of those, but uh, one of the things that's probably in the too hard category, but it was what I alluded to briefly earlier, uh, that hasn't been discussed much, and that is we tend to start more programs than we have the ability to sustain, and uh, even if we accurately estimated the costs, and that's an issue of its own, in its own right. But uh, if if the Congress could give a guideline as to here's a baseline program and here's one you want to be prepared for, but don't pursue be prepared to as best you can to shift to it if things change. Maybe you have an upside and downside in our company. We used to have a baseline budget and an upside and downside. And uh, uh, then require before you approve a new program that it has to fit within that budget. Uh, I think that would have an enormous impact. Uh, a lot of the money we lose is uh, starting things that we can't afford that we should have known them at the beginning. I think that uh, uh, the issue of changes we've talked about uh, is a big contributor and is something that, that's made for 101 to control that. It takes a lot of discipline, a lot of effort. Uh, I think we should make it very hard to start new programs and very hard to stop or change them uh, unless there's very compelling reasons. Uh, but leave it that. If you want to give me a card or something, I'll make sure that you get those documents. That Another question? Yes, sir, over here on the right. I'm Ed Swisher, former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, during the first Gulf War, uh, back when we had a pretty good team put together. Uh, but the, in those days, of course, the Soviet Union was our enemy. We talked about tanks, uh, and we knew how many Soviets had exactly where they were, 23, where they were manufactured, the uh, equivalent of the front places of the tank to 13 inches of old homogeneous steel or whatever. <laughs> so, and we designed then the main battle tank with the right caliber weapon and mobility and so forth. Uh, with today's challenge, uh, do we know from an intelligence standpoint, as well as all the other considerations, uh, still what we would like to have a force which really has the utility that we will need 25 years from now if we're still in that long range. Uh, it's almost an impossible question to answer, as you, as you know. The, uh, uh, we keep our equipment so long and technology advances. Uh, one of the things we have to do is design equipment at the outset so that we can modify it time goes along and we do it we do it a respectable job of that we can do better uh, too often it's after the fact rather than plan at the beginning to be able to do that uh, the, uh, our military forces are slow to change uh, uh, I think that's understandable because the risks of being wrong are so immense when we're dealing with people's lives is hard in the military uh, I, I think that there's a huge difference uh, 
today, uh, you kind of allude to it, that is an area you refer to in which I lived in. Uh, there were, I think it was like 60,000 nuclear weapons around the world. And uh, the number one issue when you got up in the morning, I mean, that was the number one national issue. It wasn't the economy, the environment, or anything else. It was uh, the danger of nuclear war. And uh, they were sitting there cocked and ready on both sides. And uh, if also if you were a young engineer, as I was, uh, if you wanted to work on a really important problem that made a difference, if you wanted to work where the leading edge of technology was, you wanted to work for the Defense Department. Uh, today, you probably go to work for Facebook or Google or somebody. And, uh, so it, it, I think we just have to recognize it's a different world and uh, make the most of it. We can take one more. Yes, sir. Adam Siegel, Insight for Analysis. Um, in this environment uh, where we're having defense cutbacks, traditional procurement has been much better than ready. Where do you see that going right now? If we look at percentages of what occurred in the 90s, try to apply it where we're now, we end up with perhaps even negative how would you try to balance current readiness with future readiness? Well, there's an easy part to that question, there's a hard part. Uh, uh, I've thought about this some, obviously. Uh, if, if you think you're going to go to war tomorrow, uh, you should spend probably all your money on training. If you think you're going to go to war in a few years, uh, you should probably spend uh, all your money on production in Germany. Uh, and if you think they're going to go to war in 25 years, you should spend all your money on research. Uh, so the question is, when do you plan to go to war? Uh, if, if you know that one thing, it tells you pretty much what kind of a budget you want to have. And I've not yet met the person who will tell me that. And so I think the answer is you've got to be very careful to balance all these factors. You remember there was a time in the past when we had a procurement holiday and we were going to make up for it by being more efficient. Uh, I think we did get somewhat more efficient. Uh, I went into the Defense Department, I think they, they did. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we didn't make up for the savings with procurement. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so uh, when uh, the time comes to uh, reduce budgets, the thing that uh, gets hurt the most is research, which is probably the thing that ought to be supported the most. First of all, it's a small part of the budget. But secondly, you tend not to lose wars because you have 10% fewer airplanes or tanks or ships. Uh, you tend to lose war when uh, the other guy has stirrups and you don't, or they have longbows and you don't, or they have stealth and you don't, or night vision or jet airplanes, or nuclear weapons, or what have you. Uh, it's those big breakthroughs that you've got to so, uh, I guess the bottom line is that uh, uh, I think our research is very vulnerable. I think product procurement is next, and uh, both are likely to get cut too far because that's been our pattern in the past. Uh, I, I recall going once to uh, Bill Gates was secretary and trying to encourage him to spend more money on basic research. He said, Norm, you know, if I did that, there are only two people in this building that would think it was a good idea right now. And uh, we give to his great credit, he went ahead and did that. He did increase spending on research. But uh, I, I, I'm not optimistic, frankly, about uh, our not over producing uh, R&D uh, and procurement. Of course, the reason for that is that uh, there are plenty of problems out there today, and people who are making decisions decisions today are worrying about tomorrow. So it's hard. Well, that's a great answer to the question. Uh, it's a question of resources and strategy as well, as we all know. You've been a great audience today, and Norm, uh, really appreciate your comments. And if we could all thank Norm for his. Thank you all. Thank you.